morning. <coughs> Get some energy here. Good morning. <laughs> so we're uh, very excited and very nervous to be, <laughs> to be sharing uh, our HPX Live platform with you uh, today. Um, the classroom actually has already begun. And what I'd like to do first is just give you a little bit of context for what we're going to see. So my name is Bharat Anand. I'm a strategy professor at Harvard Business School. Uh, and also serve as faculty chair of HPX, which is essentially our distance learning initiative that we created about four years ago and launched three years ago. And I have uh, several of my colleagues, Patrick Mullane, Ross Piero, and Samin Mosin, uh, and Chad Moore in here as well. Chad, where's Chad? So Chad's actually the critical guy, okay? He's gonna make sure the technology works seamlessly. Uh, so let me actually just start with a very high level overview of, of what, uh, of the context for what we're going to see. So when we, uh, you know, when we were thinking about online learning um, or distance learning about four or five years ago, the key question for us, of course, like many other schools, was uh, can we use technology to engage with students or learners at a distance, number one. Number two, create highly engaging experiences. And number three, in a way that scales. Now it turns out that if you actually look at that second and third part of the question, which is engagement that scales, that's a pretty hard trade-off to try and crack. And so what I wanted to do is actually give you some context for how we tried to approach this. Um, I will say that when we started HPX, uh, we actually were starting very small, meaning we were not thinking about you know, reaching learners in different countries and different parts of the world. We were simply asking the question, can we use online education in a way that meaningfully supplements residential education for our MBA students? Uh, so this is classic blended or multi-platform learning. Asking that question actually had a huge unintended consequence, which is if we were gonna do anything online that satisfied our MBA students, the quality bar had to be like here. <laughs> okay. um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of you know, the benefits and the, and the challenges of, of approaching it that way. But uh, let me first start with this uh, quote, which I came across a few years ago. Will the classroom of the future be abol abolished and the child be stuffed with facts as he or she sits at home? Does anyone know who said this? Or, or when? So this was uh, 1924. This was radio. What's fascinating is if we go back and look at the history of radio, a lot of the conversation we had around MOOCs in recent years was essentially exactly the same conversation. Uh, by the way, 300 universities applied for federal radio broadcasting licenses, and they started actually offering courses through radio. And the idea was fantastic. Digital's about reach. We can reach many more learners. And then basically it went sort of like this, which is if I find it challenging to hear a faculty member in the classroom for an hour, it's uh, even worse on radio. Right, so talk about completion rates and engagement and all the usual debates, it sort of literally is just you know, redux. By 1940, there was only one course offered for credit on radio. Why do I say that? Because uh, disruption through distance learning is not a new phenomenon. The first correspondence course was actually in Massachusetts about 300 years ago. Uh, and essentially, despite all this, higher education, the nature of the university, has remained more or less unchanged for the last 100 years. As one of my colleagues likes to say, universities are a major force for inertia, <laughs> right? Um, so, so what happens, um, so you know, we're looking at this five years ago. This is a crowded space. This was simply you know, a small sample of the number of organizations we're looking at in the online space, and of course everyone here. The context for us to actually start taking this seriously, and there was a case actually about 15 years ago which we discussed in our faculty about distance learning, where Clay Christensen, many of you know or have heard of, was essentially trying to rally the faculty to move online, talking about disruption. And the reality is there was a massive collective yawn on campus, right? So what triggers this recent wave? It starts with one of our graduates, Sal Khan, whose story is now familiar. That triggers Sebastian Thrun to start Udacity, then Coursera. And then Harvard and MIT look at what's happening at Stanford where faculty are leaving and taking their courses to offer online with VC-backed firms. And they said, whoa, let's do something about this. So edX is formed as a collaboration between Harvard and MIT in probably the shortest time that there was any collaboration between Harvard and MIT. <laughs> um, 
And, uh, and that's essentially the trigger for HBX. So Harvard's a federation of 13 schools. Each school makes its own decision about what to do. Uh, to cut the long story short, essentially 12 of the 13 schools went in some way, shape, or form on edX. And we at Harvard Business School did not. Now, uh, it's tempting to think we're sort of, you know, yeah, of course, the HBS guys would do something different. But the logic for this was actually quite straightforward, which is we were asking essentially three questions. What is the problem we're trying to solve? And for which learner? Is it the residential learner? Is it the off-campus learner? Uh, who's the learner? Uh, by the way, I will say it's remarkable when we talk about you know, being customer-centric to organizations out there. We talk about this all the time. And I would argue that we are so product or content-centric when it comes to doing anything, any major decision. Uh, not just in universities, by the way, in education more broadly. Right? Um, there's a book recently I've written called The Content Trap, which, uh, which elaborates on this. The second question is, how can we create a digital first experience? And so for us, camera in the classroom was not, was not necessarily the right way to go. In a way that's differentiated, and this is critical because uh, we're looking at 3,000 other organizations and universities going online, and the question for us was, you know, what gives us a license to play or to win? I mean, almost exactly the same question that uh, you know, Bob was talking about with Deborah in the last uh, session about Boise State and what differentiates them. We were asking the same question, which is when we go online, what might differentiate us? And the last question is, might this be self-sustaining? All right, uh, so this is our starting point. Okay, so this is our classroom. And it's essentially sort of an amphitheater where you have 90 people in the classroom. The architecture of, of it is such that every student can see everyone else. Uh, why is that important? Because this is the essence of case-based learning, which is we give students cases every day to read in every subject. It's all in. Every case starts with a decision by some general manager or protagonist. And we basically come in and we discuss these cases. And the faculty are facilitating conversations. Now, by the way, you see that camera up there. Uh, that's not meant to actually record the classes and take them online. It just you know, happens to be there. But the idea of recording these classes and taking them online, as you can imagine, is not particularly inspiring for the digital learner. So the question for us was, uh, you know, what can we do that actually leverages this way of teaching? Uh, I just want to add a couple of words about this. Uh, for anyone who's been through this, this is, this is a remarkably engaging way of teaching. Because uh, you're starting with problems as opposed to theory and then backing into the theory. It's very active, so everyone's all in. Everyone on the edge of their seats and you're graded on participation. Um, so there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer conversation. It's, it's truly dynamic in many ways. It's uh, very challenging for the faculty to actually manage these conversations. And so um, you know, we'd spend about five hours preparing for one session as opposed to one hour for a lecture-based session. So that's the starting point. Um, so what did we do? Uh, <clears throat> we were thinking that transferring this model online by simply camera in the classroom is not the way we want to go. We might think of creating entirely new experiences, but we were looking out there at many organizations trying to do this. And you know, one model that's actually emerged is, is having you know, faculty interact with up to 10 or 12 or 15 students on a laptop. Highly engaging experiences, but it doesn't scale because you need that live faculty interaction. And so for us, the question really was, can we do something in a digital first fashion that also scales? Okay? So that's the, that's the starting point. These were the three principles that really underpinned everything to do with HBX. As I mentioned, real world problems, active learning, and social learning. And what we did was be very reductionist, say, can we take these principles and try and think about how these principles might express themselves online? Uh, so our starting point was if we, if we try to copy what's in the classroom, we will fail. Because there's so much happens spontaneously and synchronously that we don't want to do that. But oh, technology might allow us to do many other things which we can't do in the classroom. All right, uh, so we've ended up with two platforms. These platforms, the metaphor I use is often um, what I refer to as forget and borrow. Uh, one might think of this as explore and exploit, the usual tension facing any organization trying to innovate. Uh, the first platform is the online platform. It's mainly asynchronous. There's no live faculty, so that was a design principle, which is uh, we wanted to create highly engaging experiences, but once the course starts, I said I want no live faculty interaction. Because if we do, we won't scale. Every faculty has residential teaching responsibilities. Um, 
We had big debates around this in our teams. Uh, some of my colleagues th thought I'm crazy. Uh, the way we've tried to tackle that is through two things. Painstaking course creation up front, where we're literally trying to engineer or hard code almost the teaching process that we would go through in the classroom. So for example, rather than come into class and say, you know, what is willingness to pay? This is what willingness to pay is. We'd actually give them a problem. Here's a ticket reseller trying to sell tickets. What's the price he or she should charge? Try and back out from there this idea of willingness to pay have many examples in the course platform in different contexts, trying to generalize this, and then finally have a faculty who's hard-coded in the video saying, here's what I'd love for you to take away. So that's one, and the second is peer learning, right? Uh, peer learning was critical for us to scale because if people had questions, they can't call the content experts of the faculty, they've got to call on each other. Now, that was pretty challenging. To make that work, you've got to make the online discussion boards work. Right, uh, which we know is very challenging. We did it in various ways, which we can get into offline. One of the things we did was give students incentives. So we said part of your grade actually depends on the extent to which you help each other online. That's all we said. We didn't say 50% or 10% or 5%. That's all we said. The first day, 75% of the students move online to the discussion boards. Of course, you might be thinking, are they going to answer each other correctly? Um, we were nervous as well, so we had content teams on standby. For the first three weeks, the number of times we had to jump in, in any thread, was exactly zero. So almost every question posed by them answered accurately, precisely by the peer group. So these two things now allow us to scale the online platform. And the engagement there has been um, honestly pretty phenomenal. So we have um, about 85 to 86% completion rates. Uh, many of the learners say the engagement online on that platform is comparable to the residential classroom. That brings me to HPX Live, which is what I'd call the borrow model. So the forget model was really forget everything happening in the classroom and reimagine everything online. The borrow model is HPX Live. That's a synchronous facility. It's a, it's a classroom we've built in the WGB at Studio a mile away from campus. It requires some live person there to be facilitating the conversation, and that's what we'll cut into in a second. Uh, there's, instead of 60 seats, 60 TV screens. And so you could be logged in anywhere in the world and we could be having a live case discussion. Um, and then what we've done is also have observers who can actually watch in on this. Uh, and that number is unlimited, okay? One of the things you'll see when we go to the demo is there's a chat function that students on the wall can use where what they chat appears on a ticker in the classroom and the faculty, my colleague Young Mi Moon, can actually see that. By the way, that was such a simple sort of throwaway observation. It turns out to be pretty incredible. Because for instance, if I ask a question and I say, just go to chat, I suddenly see a scroll of like 60 comments coming. I know what they want to say, which means I know who to call. <laughs> uh, usually the calling pattern is pretty random in a class, right? And you know, it's, it's like a lottery. If you call on the right person, it's great. If you don't, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it can be painful. Uh, here, I can almost see their thought bubbles. I know exactly who to call, and we'll sort of try this out, okay, when we, when we go into the classroom. So why don't we actually just maybe cut to the room, and, uh, and you'll see what's happening. So this is in Boston. Uh, by the way, go we're going to try certain features which we've never tried before, okay? So I just hope these things work. So that's, uh, that's my colleague, Young Mi Moon, um, who actually was the inspiration for this classroom, uh, HPX Live. And the place where she got the idea for this was The Simpsons. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, she was actually watching one episode, and there's one episode where you have a lot of the characters on literally what looks like a TV wall. I was like, wow, this is multi-person, synchronous. Let's try this. Um, so there's many people on the wall there. Anthony Fisher is uh, speaking right now with her. So maybe we can, can we tune in? Okay, there's this button here. Can you see me there? So this is the, so I'm raising it's my hand. When you move from dealing with somebody who's in a sort of customer service role who you're aggravated with to having them call security on you to Excellent. physically act Excellent. on you. Okay, so Anthony says, if they had just handled this particular moment differently, 
then the whole thing would have dissipated rather than escalate. There would have been no video capture of the incident, and we would not be talking about this. Christine, what do you think? So I'm not sure where that specific point is, where it went wrong. Actually, can I you hold on one second? I think I have sure. Barat live in hey. Arizona. How Professor are you? Barat Anand, how are you? Oh my gosh, this is actually working. <laughs> it is working. <laughs> how are you doing? Hi, Barat, how are you? Good. Uh, let me just actually turn well? this around okay. and show you everyone here. So we have okay. a lot of people here who are watching. <laughs> okay, everybody wave. Everybody wave. Everybody. <laughs> all right. We're all saying hello. Okay. So um, what are, what are you guys talking about? There? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. Okay. All right. Do you want to you want to know what we're talking about? Yeah. Or are you just been eavesdropping on our brilliant students no, over we didn't, here? We, we, we just heard Christina, so I don't know what the conversation is. Oh, okay. So, you know, we are actually in the middle of a case discussion about a case that my guess is you guys are all really quite familiar with. So the case involves um, United Airlines. A few weeks ago, there was a video of an incident that happened on the United Airlines flight that went completely viral. Um, in fact, my question for you is, Barat, are there folks in the audience that may by chance have seen this video? Can you ask them? The, the United video, has anyone, has anyone, everyone seen it? Great, perfect. Everyone has seen it, okay. Can you ask your class, your group over there, what was their reaction when they saw that video? Just one word. Ask them to shout out one word. Painful, horrible, horrifying. Okay. All right. So the question we are asking ourselves, we're trying to deconstruct that incident, understand why it happened and what the lessons are for business. That's Great. what we're talking about. Great. Do you guys want to participate? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, what would you like us to do? Well, what I'd like you to do is the question we are asking ourselves is, given the situation, should the CEO of United Airlines be forced to resign? And the reason, in the way that I would love for them to respond is if they have Twitter, if they could go onto Twitter and they go to visit at H, do you have a slide up to show? Yep, it's up. At, it, so okay. if folks can go to Twitter here, actually, if you get your phones out, this will be fun. Again, this is what we've never tried before. Should the United CEO okay, be forced so this, to resign? Um, at Harvard HPX, there's a poll apparently. Can you try this? And once you fill in the poll, if you want to use the hashtag HPX Live to type in why you responded the way you did. Please type in why you think so and just tweet it out using the hashtag HPX Live. Uh, meanwhile, for you guys in the room here, if you guys could fill out the internal poll, I would love to know what you guys think of whether or not Ooh, the CEO cool. okay. of United should be forced to resign. And it'll be interesting to see if your reaction is similar to the audience in Arizona. Terrific. Okay. Uh, okay, let's Are see if on? this works. Yeah, can you get on? Excellent. On so, the poll? Uh, for those of you in the class, yes. did you vote already? Yes. 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 You've all voted? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Great. Yes. Let's see. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. I won't reveal yet. Barat, did they, did they vote? Yeah. Have folks voted yet? Yes. Okay. All right. The fantastic. hashtag is uh, at Harvard HPX for the poll and at HPX, hashtag HPX live. Yes. Encourage your audience, Barat, to make comments with the hashtag because I would love to see some of those comments come up. Great. So your comments through that, she's going to be watching on Twitter on a separate screen. Okay, so this is, this is basically a workaround. Um, and by the way, for those of you in our classroom here, you are also welcome to use the chat function to insert your comments as well. Okay, are we ready to throw up the Twitter poll results? Sure. Okay, let's do it. Uh, Mike, are we ready to do that? Okay, let's throw them up. Are they? Okay, here we go. Ah, I see them. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Okay, here we go. These are the poll results. 45% oh uh, is... of your audience says yes. And 54% say no, he deserves a raise. 
I'm just kidding. That last part was just a rage. Is, this, was just is this literally, good. Youngmi, is this identical to your classroom? It's very close to our classroom results, yes. Wow. Um, okay, Philip Hussey. Is Philip in my classroom? Yes, here, okay, Nepal Communication. My question is, fantastic. Okay, um, Twitter feed. Colleen Broderick says, Colleen, where's no, Colleen? Great, she's the here. The CEO should not be forced to resign, but be accountable and follow through. You know what, let me, let me get Colleen up here. Can we get a mic? Okay. Do you want to come up here? <laughs> okay. Now, in the classroom, raise your hand if you said yes. <laughs> Raise your hand if you said yes, he should be forced to resign. All right, Youngly, we have yeah. Colleen here. So why don't you, <laughs> okay, wait. so that's the camera. Um, all right, we have Philip, we have Emily. Yeah, Emily, are you willing to so make an argument for why yes, he should be forced to resign? Okay, Sure. let's go with the, let's go with the debate between Emily. So do we have, Col hi Colleen, how are you? Good. How are you doing? You can use the mic. Okay. Use the mic. Yeah. So right. mic? Okay. about half of my class disagrees with you, Colleen. About half of my class disagrees. That's fair. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to turn to Emily Bodice over here, and she's going to make an argument for why she believes the CEO of United should be forced to resign. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to rebut that. So, Emily, go ahead. Sure. So I took a look at the CEO's LinkedIn profile, and he really doesn't have a ton of customer experience in his background. He's been in finance. He worked at CSX, which is like a shipping container company. Last I checked, shipping containers do not complain if they get bumped from a flight. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this guy is really not able to handle the stress of a, you know, an airline where people and situations can go viral. I mean, Air United had an incident a few years ago where someone's guitar was broken and the guy wrote a song on YouTube. It was a huge sensation back then in 2009. And so I just think that he has some deficiencies. He's not brought in, brought in a team around him to handle this appropriately, and I think that's why he should be let go. All right, Colleen, your opportunity to respond. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't think this is about a person. I think this is about an organization, and I think this, requ this requires an organizational response, and by removing him, I think it's uh, expressing that we don't hold people accountable, and that we don't have structures in place to ensure growth of our greatest leaders. And so I think by keeping him on board and ensuring that he's successful with the follow through, that there'll be more uh, credibility on United's side over time. But Colleen, if I could push back. <laughs> is it in many ways? I, in I, many didn't, ways? I didn't hear you, everyone's laughing. <laughs> okay. In many ways, isn't the ultimate kind of accountability to ask someone to resign? In other words, if you're going to really demonstrate accountability, isn't the way to do it is for the board of directors to ask this man to step down and to find somebody else who can get United to a better place? I would consider that response. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, Colleen. I thanks. really thanks appreciate so much. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> that was that was not bad, Barad. That was not bad at all. Oh my cold gosh! Call. Like I'm scared of you cold calling now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to teaching this case, if that's okay. Unless you have something else for us. Yeah, we just want to watch you f guys for a few minutes, just to see what's happening on the screen. So go ahead, just run the discussion. Okay, absolutely. Um, so getting back to this question, what does accountability mean in this context? Does accountability mean firing the CEO? Does it mean taking a set of remediating actions? Well, how do you guys think about accountability in this context? Oh, and by the way, actually I'm going to call on Dave because Dave just sent a chat note saying, should Bill Belichick resign for his players' misbehavior? Huh. <laughs> so I take it that means, Dave, that you think he should not have to resign. Uh, I don't think so in this case. I think it was definitely mishandled. Um, definitely the values didn't convey all the way down. But if we apply that measurement, how many CEOs or other leaders would be in that same position where someone who's on the floor, if you will, on the execution side, is not um, you know, in, in alignment with uh, corporate values? Or if someone breaks the law, how, uh, how high up the chain does it go in order to remediate it? Okay. I mean, but just as a reminder, and again, to push back gently on you, Dave, this was not a minor violation. 
This was a dude that was bloody, and they were dragging him down the aisle of an airline. So just keep that in mind. Sue? Yes. Um, before Emily spoke, I agreed that the CEO should stay in place, but she actually convinced me otherwise because I've been thinking about the CEO and his reactions in the first couple of days. Ah, okay. You know, I've been doing customer service a very long time. Yeah. The very first thing you do is admit the mistake. Okay. The second thing you do is apologize, right? So, okay. Um, so he, he did apologize eventually. I mean, first they came eventually. up. He came up with a statement, and mm -hmm. and then and then there was a reaction. So by the way, to the I can statement. see the boards. Yep. I can click that on was that quite and see negative. the boards. And then and then he backed his employees, which is great. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> and then he and came then out he with an apology. Right. Yes. Exactly. But I think um, if you don't understand customer service to that level, how are you ever going to turn an organization around to be more customer-centric? Okay. All right. So let's... Um, if All right. You let's, believe let's maybe mute. The point of failure is at the point... So that's it. <laughs> so... Colleen, that was, how was it? Amazing. It's pretty scary, right, to me? It is. I mean, I think the interesting part of this is then how do you make sure that you're not creating a Yeah, one of the things that our HBS alums can tell you is that, you know, students often prepare a case and they come in and they've like read this case for an hour. In every class, we can't call on everyone, right? So maybe about a third of the students get in. And sometimes they leave sort of feeling frustrated. It's like, you know, I didn't get in. So chat really allows that kind of engagement, which, you know, you might not get in the classroom. The other thing, by the way, which was important was this raise your hand. So oftentimes in our classrooms, uh, when students want to get in, you know, they raise their hand, and sometimes it can be like pretty aggressive, right? <laughs> and you could start seeing like, you know, gender biases in the classroom. Like the men are just like falling out of their seats. And the women are like, you know, raising their hand. Um, here what's nice is it's completely neutral. It's like you press, raise your hand, the screen goes red. One of the things we've actually considered experimenting with is that for the male learners on the wall, um, you know, the red disappears a little faster. <laughs> so, but it's one of those things where, again, you can just press the button, raise your hand, we know who wants to, who wants to get in. Questions? Let's just, you know, open up. Yeah. So the United case is obviously very recent. Um, yeah. And I know Harvard business cases in general aren't antiquated. There's more current issues. But this is so fresh. I'm curious, do you use HBX to talk about sort of less like n to go not as deep with certain things as just to stay more current and more timely yeah, or are question. they also using the cases that we you know, yeah, access in HBS? Great question. So by the way, just to clarify, <laughs> so yeah, so our cases are typically these documents which are like nine, 15 pages long and it takes a while to produce, right? So you write a case on Netflix and six months later it looks outdated. But part of the issue is we're not trying to keep up with every current event. We're trying to place the students in that decision moment, right? Having said that, you're onto something. So one of, the, one of the use cases for this that we envisioned was, um, you know, this was really triggered a few years ago by the, I don't know if you remember, the tsunami in Japan. One of our colleagues, Hiro, uh, he's a Japanese faculty member, he literally was just trying to pull together people and say, you know, what can we do? Like, what should the response be? That's not easy to get people, you know, you can conference, conference call them in, to get them to campus is hard. This is sort of cool because in some sense you can actually take those moments and just say, let's get 15 or 30 people on the wall and just have a conversation around what the response might be. So that's one use case. Um, there are several others I can talk about, but you know, um, yeah. Thanks, so we were just hearing from Boise State about how they're working with you. Yeah. And if you work with a number of other colleges, are those students gonna be able to interact like we just did or would that swamp your students and is it really just a very cool method of remotely viewing your classroom? Good question. So, so the Boise State Partnership is with 
uh, us on the online platform. Okay, so the other platform I was talking about, that's where we created these three courses, accounting, economics for managers, business analytics. That's what we call the core credential, which was really targeted to liberal arts students, as Bob was saying. Uh, this is totally different. So initially we thought of this as exec ed, but we're now just seeing all kinds of use cases. So for instance, in that core program that you know, Boise State students would benefit from, once in the entire program we have a live session. We can have 60 students on the wall, but we can have 500 view it literally on their laptops. And even though they're not on the wall, they can just use chat like we just did. What's cool about that is uh, we then have someone in the side room curating that chat and just feeding in certain comments onto the wall. So it might say, you know, John from Oklahoma had this question. The faculty member there is saying, okay, what do you guys think? You know, John had this question. Um, we thought the engagement was going to be different for people on the wall versus what we call the passive observers. It's almost identical. So literally, if you're sitting here and just you know, logging in as an observer, you just feel like you're part of the conversation. We haven't rolled that out yet in terms of integrating it with the online courses. But you know, that's obviously a direction we can go in. Um, but in terms of scaling, you know, initially we thought this wouldn't scale because there's 60 on the wall. But with the observer model, you know, this, this can scale to literally any number. So, yeah. So, thank you. Can you hand this Thanks. So obviously, um, HBS professors are really comfortable in a room with a lot of people. But this is a different skill set to be in front of a camera, to be in front of a wall. So how do you train your faculty <laughs> to do this? Is it possible to train? Yeah. I mean, they're just definitely teachable skills, yeah. but how have you yeah. uh, worked with that? I would say it's, it's almost the same skills as we require in the case-based classroom. Um, and the reason being, you know, this, this room would not be great if you came in and just lectured. You're not, you know, you might as well just do that through a webinar, right? You're not using the facility for what it is. How do you engage people? That's essentially almost the same skill. One of the things we've learned, though, is I don't think you can take a teacher who's struggling in our residential classrooms and hope that this somehow makes them better. <laughs> um, so you, know, you just need to know how to teach. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the things. But um, what's nice about this, though, is we can actually have some of our junior colleagues start by teaching in this classroom, which is a little lower risk, right, if you're teaching people who are not necessarily like these MBAs on campus, and then you know, train them and get them back on campus. So that's one of the things we're trying to do. Uh, is there any optimum number, or is it just more the merrier you can have? In terms of the observer model? The participants. Or? On the wall, so we have up to 60. Um, you know, we've run a lot of sessions with 30, 35. I think that works well. If you get down to 15, it's too small. So, you know, you just need disagreement. By the way, it, it, it actually reminds me a little bit of, um, I was reading uh, Gladwell's Outliers recently. And he was talking about optimal class size. And what's interesting is, you know, it's, it's not the case that the smaller the better, right? Because you need diversity of viewpoints and perspectives and so on. That's exactly what we find. So, um, you know, in our residential classrooms, when we have our courses on campus, if the classes are about 10 people, that's sort of too small. Uh, 70 doesn't feel big. You know, 70 doesn't feel big. Um, I mean, that's one of the things about this, this method, which is, you know, which is pretty cool. Others, yeah, sorry, this side. Uh, directionally, do you know the cost of the studio? It's like, it looks cool. Yeah, but, thank uh, you. There's a lot, of, yeah. a lot of stuff in there, so what's yes. the cost, yeah. if you know it? And I can't tell you. <laughs> 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 so, so suffice it to say that, uh, you know, talking about sustainability, right? The costs of building both these platforms were non-trivial. Non when we went online, the courses there, we're charging about $1,500 per course, and then we give financial aid to students who can't afford it, uh, up to 90% aid. Um, so in fact, we just launched a program for um, scholars of this organization called Stepping Stone, which is really designed to you know, seek out uh, kids from uh, low-income backgrounds who have talent. And they take them in from fifth grade all the way through high school, and then sort of have an informal mentoring role through college. So, so, you know, for 
kids who basically can't afford the 1500, we're basically giving that away, you know, for the most part. Uh, we have a revenue model there, so there is a path to break even, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. For this, we've actually not monetized explicitly so far. One of the things we want to do is just get the engagement levels up to a point where we can then say, okay, we're ready to start offering exec ed programs. Um, and I think that moment, in fact, is now. So our team now feels confident that uh, we are ready to launch exec ed programs next year. We'll probably launch about four or five of them, entirely virtual. So there are some programs we run on campus, and frankly, it's challenging for executives to come even for a week to campus, particularly for the senior most executives, but also for many others. In terms of the price point we're gonna charge, you know, it'll probably be comparable to exec ed, not quite the same rates, but part of the idea is, you know, you get the engagement, you get the live interaction, you don't have to travel, you don't have the productivity loss from actually leaving your job for one week or two weeks, and, and this is the most interesting, the format can actually be much more flexible. So when you actually think about why we have 12 sessions in an exec ed program rammed into four days, it's only for one reason, which is there's a fixed cost of traveling. Now we can actually say if there's a 12 session program, oh, we can have a session a week. Actually have you do projects along the side and, and you know, that's one way to actually run these programs. By the way, I'll tell you, um, you know, there's many other things we're thinking about. So one really cool thing that we did last year, it was, truly exciting was uh, have a research seminar through HBX Live. So what is the, you know, what's the imperative there? I mean, think about the way research seminars actually are run on most universities. A faculty member writes a paper, they'll then travel to about 15 universities to try and get input from faculty at other places to comment on the paper, and you're targeting universities where you have some expert in that field. That is a painful, long process. <laughs> So what we tried is we said, let's get 20 strategy scholars in the room, spread around the world, had someone from Columbia come in, give the paper in the studio, and it was truly amazing. I mean, you had these 20 scholars on the room, you know, where we can now run seminars in principle with anyone, anywhere. So different use cases. But uh, yeah, in terms of the cost, I mean, there is, you know, there is a path to break even and possibly more for this classroom. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's not, let me put it this way, it's not, it's not $100,000 and it's not 10 million. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> so I'm guessing um, now this platform, there's a lot of people that are able to come to the exec ed or the different formats that haven't uh, previously been able to do so. So I'm interested to know how that changes the kind of students that you're seeing, the kind of dynamic in the classroom, and then do you see a path for this then changing the actual enrollment in HPS, like the, the standard HPS program yeah, as well? That's a great question. Um, so, actually, what do you think? I mean, how would you think about that question? Do you I would, think this is I complimentary mean, or do you think this is substitutive to the campus experience? I think it's a mix. Um, but I would guess there's a healthy amount of compliment Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that you're going to see a larger uh, international population. I think it was, I went to HBS, but it was in 2005. And I think back then it was about 30% international. I'm not sure what it is today. Um, but I imagine it's going to be even more yeah. international, maybe 60 or 70% yeah. international. Um, and, I'm, and I can imagine that this could find its way into, if the engagement is as high, I mean, clearly it is, as uh, is 85% completion, and you're not seeing material difference between that and standard engagement in the classroom, that this could actually feed into the core curriculum as well and enable you know, people that couldn't otherwise attend uh, to do so. Yeah. Uh, other thoughts on this question? Anyone else? What do you think? We have a bunch of HPS alums in the room. Yeah. You wouldn't be nervous? No. Why? Because it would make HBS um, education available to more people. Maybe the degree would be a different degree, um, residential yeah. or online, but you do that already, yeah. right? That there's difference, differences in the degree programs, yeah. like the exec ed and the residential. Yeah. That I got out of HBS was yeah. really the interaction, yep. the physical interaction with you know my learning group. Outside my, the classroom. Yeah, my, it, like yeah. first year, I remember first year, you know we meet 
you know, an hour before class and, you know, our study group would kind of talk through everything. And, you know, and that, that was very, very helpful for me and, you know, also built lifelong relationships. How do you guys deal with that, right? Because I think that, I mean, I love, I mean, it, you know, just watching this demonstration to me was amazing because I, I, I also felt kind of the, the cold sweat, you know, with the cold call. <laughs> when and, Colleen was here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, it was you know, it, and I, I, I felt really bad for her. <laughs> But it was, uh, but I, I, but how, how do you guys deal with that human interaction? Yeah. So, uh, so the short answer is we can't, right? And there are ways that we might, you know, supplement HPX Live with the online platform so that you have some interaction there as well. But you know, you're never going to mimic. And this is, and this is what I was saying earlier, which is, in a sense, these are not, you know, which is better and which is worse. I mean, this is much better for folks who can't travel. What you're describing is much better for folks who actually want to engage with others in the evenings, in the afternoons, and so on and so forth, right? Coming back to your question, so I'll just offer some ways we're thinking about this. So your instinct is exactly the first instinct that everyone on campus has, <laughs> which is, oh my god, like what is this going to mean for exec ed residentially, for publishing, and so on and so forth. It turns out there's a lot of complementarities, and part of this is also creating complementarities. Executives come to our residential programs, after they finish, their number one question is, how can we take this back to our teams? And so what they often do is they'll, they'll order the cases and five copies, and they'll go back and they'll distribute it. But then you don't have that same experience. Part of the idea is maybe we can make this complementary to residential exec ed, where if the senior most managers come to the residential program, you could then use this for cascading down. So that's just one, you know, that's one simple example. The second is, um, the second is lifelong learning, which is we have 70,000 alums. And, and we talk about lifelong learning, but getting them back to our campus is really hard. I mean, they've sort of had the best experience, right, when they were an MBA or in the exec ed programs. What's truly exciting now is we can start offering programs to our alums I mean, you know, you could literally just start thinking of ideas. The, the best of 2017. Like, let's take topics like blockchain, the internet of things, inequality, globalization, have 10 faculty spread through the year just running these sessions with, with alums, not with alums. But this is a way now to engage with them in ways that are just much more meaningful than saying, can you write us a check? <laughs> Which is honestly, like, oftentimes, you know, what they tell us and what we know is, is the nature of the interaction after they've completed. So that's the second thing that I think is really, really exciting. Um, the last thing is, you know, I think you mentioned this, which is it's not the same degree. I mean, so, so we only offer one degree, which is the MBA degree. Even for executives who come to campus, we're offering nine-week programs, but those are certificate programs. And so in some sense, what we're doing online and through distance is offering certificate programs Again, highly engaging experiences, but it's not the MBA degree, right? And that's, um, so that's, you know, so that's another way. By the way, I will say, when we've asked this question to our alums, you know, we often have conversations with them. And it gets particularly interesting when we get to the online platform. Because, you know, here you can still think of numbers like 500, 1,000, and so on. The online platform, we could get to 30,000 in principle, right? 50,000. We had a group of alums a couple of years ago, and, and um, this is when they had seen the platform, and they said, okay, in terms of the product, you know, what you've created is actually on par with what we might experience in the classroom. And someone asked about this question about, you know, how do you think about the brand? And I posted back to them. I said, you know, how do you think about this question? Is there a number beyond which you'll simply be nervous, regardless of the quality of the product and the experience and so on? What is that number? Um, there was a group of 90 alums. Um, two were nervous at about 30,000. Three at about 50,000. And the rest basically had your reaction, which is, this is the mission of the school, right? The mission of the school is to train and educate leaders who make a difference in the world. If we get to 100,000, I mean, that is like 0.1% of the world's population. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this is truly what we're here for. So, so I, was, I was truly inspired by that conversation. I have to say, it's something, you know, to me, what we're keeping an eye on is the learners, you know, the talent pool. Like, that's the question 
that we're really trying to go after, um, not necessarily brand dilution per se. So. Do you have plans to yes. do the blended model yes, between absolutely. the online and live? Uh, it's a great question. So we're already doing this. So for something that we call the general management program, which is basically our exec ed program for people with 15 to 30 years experience, they used to come to campus uh, for three weeks or four weeks, go back to their organizations for three weeks, and then come back to campus for three weeks. What we've now done is created what's called module zero, which is before they come to campus, and here's what's sort of stunning almost to us, the core program that I, decide, that I, that I described, which we thought was targeting undergraduates, uh, they are saying we don't have the accounting background. Can we actually take that program online before we actually come to the GMP program? And then in between the two residential programs, for three weeks we basically lost touch, in, touch with them. So we're trying to experiment with HPX live sessions in between, where we can just keep up that interaction. Um, that's honestly just scratching the surface. I think we can be much more innovative in thinking about how to blend um, these two. And you know, in some sense, in some sense, we can go in very different um, in very different directions. You know, for MBA students, for instance. I mean, again, Bob was talking about flexibility with online. Uh, we've created something called the field program, where students can go out into the field and you know spend some time there. The online platform actually gives us many more degrees of freedom, which is. Instead of spending 3% of their time off campus, they might spend 10% of their time off campus. And we can still have interaction with them. For students who are purely online right now, like the HBX learners, they're 100% online. We can start thinking of actually having 3 to 5% residential components for them. Uh, just in that vein, this last Saturday, we had an event called HBX Connect, where the idea simply was community building for people who were taking the HBX courses. We sent out an email in March. We said, if anyone would like to come to campus for a day, you know, for taking some classes, just meeting each other, and so on, please come. 450 people showed up. And you know, folks were traveling from Australia for one day. It, it sort of like blew us away. I mean, you sort of almost felt like crying. <laughs> uh, but that, that really allows us to do things now in much more multi-platform, you know, in a much more multi-platform approach. So would love ideas, by the way, on that. Um, we're, I think we're just very early in the, in the whole game, yeah. So you framed the, the challenge initially between your very scalable asynchronous model and your highly engaged uh, synchronous live model. Now that you've figured out the secret sauce, it sounds like you've got scalability uh, in your live yeah. course. What, what are you thinking in terms of how many rooms in the future and how do you drive the technology and cost of that down? Yeah, it's a great question. So by the way, just to come back to the cost question, I was just being facetious. The cost of this is not bank breaking, right? So IE uh, Business School in Madrid, and we have a colleague here who is in fact an HBS alum, they have built a platform which looks pretty similar. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Um, Can I give you the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, Yes, our platform, we call it the War Room, and it actually delivers the same kind of experience. And if I may um, add it to some of the advantages that uh, we're experimenting, that we're finding as we experiment with, with this new platform, is that surprisingly, um, some of the uh, participants to those courses actually not only come for the lifelong learning and the, um, you know, the great learning experiences, but as a byproduct to that, they're actually, and back to another the comment of the other HBS alum, they're actually finding really rich opportunities to network. Because believe it or not, after a number of sessions where you actually interact in a high quality manner with other fellow um, students, um, there is that bonding that takes place. And oftentimes, you know, it's very relevant networking for the topic at hand. And um, so a great experience so far, one that uh, as you are, we're still discovering, um, but um, and one that we are yeah. also planning to scale big time because we see a huge potential. Clearly, the cost of this, I mean, that you know, when we built it, and Chad, I don't know if you want to say anything to this or Patrick, uh, one of the things we were trying to do is use off the shelf technology. So we were partnering with Cisco and McCann and all these other players, uh, but the design was essentially our own, right? We were thinking, like, what, you know, what would really make this work in a way that sort of mimics the classroom. So when it came down to even writing the board, 
if it took an extra second, we were like, no, not good enough, right? Clearly, you can imagine the cost of building the first version was higher than it will be for the cost of building future versions. And you know, honestly, also, there's other ways to work around some of the bottlenecks that we still see, like onboarding. Onboarding takes about 10 minutes. Uh, we'd love to reduce it to a second, just like Skype. And there are ways to do that. So, so that cost will come down as well. Um, you know, and then just partnering with others and early stages on this to license the platform. If folks want to build it elsewhere, um, you know, we're more than happy. Uh, again, part of the issue is we don't think of the classroom architecture as the only magic behind what happens, right? It's sort of like the combination of the case, the students, the faculty, the pedagogy, the classroom. Um, so, you know, like all the residential classrooms, I mean, hundreds of business schools have mimicked that physical architecture. But, but you know, there's something else that happens. So, um, if you're interested in licensing, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, please. So I have two questions. The first one is because I understand it must be very expensive to build up this um, lab. So, but actually for tuition fee, is it actually cheaper or more expensive than the traditional way? So that's my- For idea. this particular classroom? Yes. Um, so let me share some ballpark numbers with you. Can I? <laughs> so if you look at our residential exec ed programs, Let's say for a one-week program, which is about 15 sessions, you might charge about $9,000. So that's about $600 per participant per session. Uh, we'd probably set the exec ed rates for this at about 70 to 75% of that. Uh, so that's roughly what we're talking about. So you, know, you could argue in principle, why not charge even more? Because you're saving on all these ancillary costs like travel and so on. But you know, I don't think we want to go there yet. Uh, so yes, tuition on this will be lower uh, for those exec ed programs. But now we have a lot of flexibility because it's not the same rate for every program. The research seminars will essentially be free. You know, when we use it for the course students, that's an add-on to what they're taking in the online courses, which is basically free. So we have a lot of flexibility to do different things. Um, All right, thank you. So, so I have a yeah. second question to follow. Um, so nowadays, like um, an HBS case study model, it's very popular because I'm from Tsinghua University in China. Um, so for example, our business school, our Shortman College, um, we all set up our classrooms um, similar to the HBS case study model classroom. So I'm wondering, do you see this kind of equipment service or virtual classroom type of thing um, be replicated in other universities' campuses, just like what we have done past for the traditional case study method? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it already is, right? So, so I think we probably will see more of that. And again, if you're interested in partnering, let me know. <laughs> Should we go back? Is the classroom over, Chad, or are they still going? It is. OK, great. Terrific. Yeah, please. Quick question. You mentioned that um, participation is, uh, is part of the grade or is is it captured by the technology so that Oh, what a lovely question. Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges of grading participation in the residential classrooms, by the way, this is what happens. We're hearing the students. We walk back to our offices. We sit for half an hour with a spreadsheet, and we're trying to recap what happened. <laughs> that is a fundamentally imperfect technology, right? And so when students come to us, and you know, I can now say this since all the alums here have graduated, and they say, you know, how are we doing? We ask back, like, how do you think you're doing? <laughs> right? Now, there's often error in recall, right? Like 10% error for every class. And our hope is that error sort of washes out over the course of a semester. Over time, we've had scribes in the classrooms. So we do that increasingly now, where they're just recording the conversations. That's costly. What's beautiful here is you have the videotape. And what's also nice is you have the chat log. And literally, the second the classroom is over, we can get the chat log. Uh, so in terms of grading, it's just much easier. We haven't actually used this still for grading participation and like formal programs like you're envisioning. But yeah, I mean, technology does, does make it easier. Bro, I, want, I just want to add on something. Yeah. So uh, I get asked this question by our intrepid sort of volunteer over there, Colleen, when I, oh, when I went to talk to her. But, uh, we, we haven't really scratched the surface as much with the live studio as the other platform with respect to student or, or user analytics. But we have had an initial um, kind of graphic that was shown to me recently. It was really cool because we can see each user 
with kind of a horizontal access with a timeline. I know that IE has stuff like this as well, where we can see when somebody raised their hand. You can, you can definitely see the, <laughs> the eager beavers because you know, there's people who have like a solid red line across because they're raising their hand every two seconds to, to try and uh, jump in. Um, you can see when people have used chat. One thing we can't see yet, but for example, that was uh, is something we need to figure out is we can't see when they were called on. You can see when they raise their hand, but because there's no kind of technological trigger that happens when they're called on, you, you can't see that. But it still is a great prompt for a faculty member um, to be able to see how the, how the class progressed and, and who was involved in what way. You know, the other thing I'll just add to that is, again, when we look at uh, whether students were engaged in a particular class, like right now, th what we're relying on is our instinct. And then maybe the survey at the end of class would said, you know, were you engaged? Now, that's a summary statistic which captures a lot of what happened during the classroom. If the class went on for 70 minutes, there are moments when the students are probably engaged, more engaged, less engaged. Uh, one cool thing, this week, actually, later on, we're talking to a company that does facial recognition technology patterns just to see during the class, you know, what were the heat moments, what are the cold moments, so that even if it's a case I've taught 30 times, you know, there might be that five-minute discussion where it's not working. Do you know what I'm saying? So that feedback for the faculty is going to be fantastic. I'm so excited about that, actually, going forward. A couple more? Yeah. yeah. I, I assume retention is a big deal at Harvard. Retention? Yeah. Off. Yeah, I, I have a question about retention rates. What are the differences between the online programs and the in-person programs? So retention, completion rates, you mean? Yes. So completion rates in the online programs for Harvard Business School, I said, 83 to 85%, um, again, with zero live faculty interaction. Now, there's many reasons for that, right? So one is you're paying something, and we know that the moment you charge something, completion rates go up, maybe to 30 or 50%. That's just selecting on motivation. But then there's engagement, which is very different, right? So I might pay, but then it feels like torture to actually like go through this program, but I'm like, I'm going to stick with it because I've paid the $1,000. So engagement is the other metric we're tracking, and that's been really fantastic. Um, you know, 85%, like what did we expect coming out, of the, coming out of the gates? We were hoping for 80% or above. Now we're hoping for 90% or above, right? So we keep trying to improve things. Hunt Lambert, who's here, who's probably done more in online education at the university, the rest of the university, can also speak to completion rates in the rest of the university. I don't know if you want to say anything, Hunt, about that. <clears throat> Thanks, Bharat. It's, it's always dangerous. Uh, the Extension School has open access courses and also degree seekers, and so we have averages that distort it. But our typical course completion rate post drop ad, so the student is economically and emotionally committed, is in a similar range, 85% or so. And part of that, honestly, is the effect of the courses being open access and uncompromising in their assessment. So many students think they can do the course and learn through assessment that they can't. Interestingly, to be admitted to our programs for degree, you have to take three courses and get a B or better. Behind that, those that get admitted as adult part-time learners graduate at a 90% average rate, which is 50 points higher than the national average. And so this idea that students, that you're implying that students could come in and do some of this before your program, and prove they're really ready for it is ultimately going to complete, uh, raise completion rates for almost anybody. So in fact, one of the things we did last year, which was exciting, was partner with the Extension School and Hunt to offer core for credit through the Extension School for people taking the online programs there. Um, all right, one more question, I think. I wanted to add a few actually comments on some of the uh, on, on the, some of the points that you were making and really encouraging your licensing business. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the couple of things that I um, wanted to address the room, especially for the educators in the room. Number one, I think we all feel a little bit shy about talking about cost. So the investment is, is a sizable investment. But I do think, as you pointed out, there is a path to break even. And I would actually undermine the financial component of this compared to the challenge of actually embarking professors to um, teach in a different way. So um, I do think you know um, the cost is an important variable, but it's um, for I think both institutions, it is the possibility of what opens in terms of new ways of educating. And, um, and along those lines, another comment that I wanted to add which is the analytics and the support to deliver better outcomes. Um, 
at our, you know, uh, online programs using the WOW Room, we work very closely with our learning and innovation team. We have a learning data, you know, our learning and data science team right beside us because we can do two things. One, certainly be thoughtful about engagement and how to drive and how to best predict the obstacles to engagement and address those with the right interventions, but as importantly, help faculty at that time to really make the most of that class, not only with you know, understanding what the, the morale in the room is, but really supporting them in creating the right debate of you know, who's actually done well and prepared well for the class, who's doing well in the assignments, how do you pair those with people who, who are struggling. So the potential of improving outcomes you know, through um, this new experiences and through the measurement and collection of data uh, as we go is, is tremendous. So I would actually think about this less of a, you know, of a pure cost investment, but as a, I mean, and in, in, in a just pure, only sort of an online kind of experience, more as a way of how do we think differently of teaching and learning with yeah, me, the online enablement. Let me just add something to that. So, so in a sense, as I said at the beginning, you know, some of what we did was really inspired by what's happened outside education, um, particularly in media over the last 20, 25 years. Um, you know, when we think about digital first, when we think about complementarity, when we think about connectedness, those were the ideas that really inspired us on both these platforms. One of the things that's been actually pretty exciting and interesting is when we think about use cases for this classroom, we've actually gotten in some TV guys now, uh, particularly in television news, and their eyes just light up when they think about what can be done to news programs through this classroom. I mean, literally, the producers are coming in and just saying, why do we have talking heads, like basically just telling us what they think about the world, as opposed to 60 people on the wall, and you can literally follow up on any conversation with, with an interesting debate. So that's, I have to say, that's been like, one of the really cool things. Um, one executive recently who ran TV for about 20 years at one of the major uh, studios, um, he came in and said, he said, you know, at this point in my life, there's not too many things I get excited about, but this was, this was quite something. So, so we are, I think, just to your point, in very early days in thinking about use cases, and, and, and I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, this is to us the most exciting thing in terms of the promise of digital in education, which is, uh, you know, there's many things we can talk about, like disruption and what happens to the on-campus programs and so on and so forth and cost, but, but the possibilities, I think we're just scratching the surface. And, and I keep saying, we're much, much closer to the starting point than the finish line. Um, and so, you know, the more the merrier. So, thank you all.